Well, hi everyone, it's uh, Pete here from the Pain Toolkit, and yes, we are back, we are back with the second Pain Toolkit Conversations, and um, please to say I've got some groovy people with me today, well it's evening here at the moment, but it'll, it's different times where all the other guys are, so I just want to say thanks for um, thanks for joining us again. Um, so what I want to, what our theme tonight is going to be, uh, well we're going to start off with Meaningful Movement. That was suggested by uh, Bronnie Thompson, our good friend Bronnie Thompson down here in New Zealand. Um, so, but before then, I thought it'd be useful if we sort of just whiz around so the viewers and listeners can find out, uh, discover who who everybody is. So I think every, well, hopefully everybody knows a little bit who I am and whatnot. Um, Keith, do you want to sort of fire us off and then we'll whiz around? I know Keith is my co, well, we're both co-pilots here, both facilitators, so I'll hand over to you, Keith, and then we'll whiz around everybody else. All right. Well, thanks, Pete. I'll uh, I'll try and keep it short. For those who know me, it's very painful for me to have a short conversation. Um, mm -hmm. My name is uh, Keith Meldrum. I live in Kelowna, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, I am I'm a civil engineer technologist, and I work in construction. I'm a vice president of a construction company. I'm married, got a wonderful little dog whom you may hear bark somewhere in the background at some point today. Um, I just also happen to be a person who lives with persistent pain. I'm one of five, but uh, that doesn't define who I am. It's just one of the things that make up this wonderful tapestry that is my life. Um, I'm really happy to be here uh, today. Really appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to work with Pete on another one of these. The first pain toolkit conversation is such a hit. So I'm excited about Meaningful Movement. Um, I think it's a great uh, conversation starter. And uh, let's turn it over. So I'm going to go around on my screen. So it'll be in my order. And just uh, ask everybody interested, introduce themselves a little bit. And so, Bronnie, you're next up on my screen. Thank you. I'm uh, Bronnie Lennox Thompson from the future. This is Saturday morning in New Zealand <laughs> and it's spring. And that's why if I sneeze, it's the hay fever and pollens. And, and I too have um, Miss Molly May, the Labradoodle, who may decide that it is time that I paid her attention. Um, I'm a postgraduate educator. So I manage our postgraduate programs in pain and pain management at the University of Otago. Um, here in Christchurch, and I also live with chronic pain. I live with fibromyalgia. Like Keith, it's not all of me. It's just a bit. It's like the fact that I have to wear glasses. And so, yeah, it's an absolute pleasure to be part of part of this team. It's wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Next up on my screen, is, playing the home game, is Virginia McIntyre. Thank you, Keith. And thank you, Keith and Pete, for putting this on. This is a great topic tonight, Meaningful Movement, and having some other people join us. Uh, I'm joining from Canada, from Nova Scotia, from the East Coast, way for the other coast from Keith. I'm also someone who lives with pain, and I'll say it doesn't define me either. It is just a part of who I am. I am the president of People in Pain Network. We're an organization that supports people with pain through peer support, uh, pain advocate in Canada, and with many other committees, and just trying to move, nudge some of these things forward. So thank you for joining us, and it's nice to see everybody. Great. Thanks, Virginia. I also have the opportunity to work with Virginia and some other stuff, and she's amazing. Next up on my screen dead center is Amy Eicher, fresh back from the wonderful world of Disneyland. So Amy, over to you. Hey, uh, my name is Amy Eicher and I live in Normal, Illinois, which is smack in the middle of the state of Illinois. And I am a pain coach and an author. And I experienced 20 years of chronic pain, which did resolve and now am the wonderful winner of long COVID that I have been dealing with for the last two years. Um, so that's brought new and wonderful education to me through lived experience as well as looking at you know blossoming research so um i am i'm pleased to be part of this conversation as somebody that helps people figure out how to live with pain so it doesn't define them uh and and now i'm also dabbling in chronic fatigue because i'm i'm learning to live with that so um it just I'm so thrilled that we're having these open conversations amongst people with, with the, you know, the interest in reading the research, but also like living with it. So thank you again for this opportunity. Great. Thanks, Amy. 
Next up, uh, another uh, East Coaster here in Canada is David Flusk. David, welcome and please introduce yourself. Thanks, Keith. Uh, great to be here. Uh, once upon a time, many years ago, I uh, ran into Pete on, I guess, what was Twitter and thought, <laughs> what's this pain toolkit thing? And uh, fast forward, and here we are, and I'm uh, part of the conversation, which I'm really grateful for. Uh, I also, uh, like he said, live in Canada. I'm uh, I'm half an hour ahead of uh, Virginia uh, here in Newfoundland in St. John's. Um, I'm a pain medicine physician. Um, I practice in the community. Uh, I have a large community-based practice. Uh, outside of the clinic, um, I'm part of a great group of subject matter experts that put together a national curriculum on chronic pain for the undergraduate medicine program in Canada. I'm currently working on a postgraduate medical education curriculum for chronic pain. So uh, really grateful to be part of that organization, which is the Associations of Faculty of Medicine Canada. And I'm also the uh, Atlantic co-director of the uh, Mentorship Network for Pain, Mental Health and Addictions here in Newfoundland, which is also uh, operating in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick and PEI. So thanks for uh, having me. And uh, I hope I learn a lot from you folks tonight as well. Thanks, David. And, and, and I think maybe you could pick your game up a little bit because you're kind of slacking off a little there. So we'd like to see you just, you know, jump in a little more with everything you're doing. So that is fantastic stuff. Um, and as they say, last but certainly not least is my friend Jerry Durham. I've had the privilege of meeting him once in person at the San Diego Pain Summit, and I stalk him religiously on social media, and we lament over baseball. Um, so, Jerry, thanks for joining us, Brian. Thank you. Uh, thank you both, Keith and Pete, for inviting me. I got to be honest, I was very excited about this, and it might be the first time... <clears throat> I, I'm, I was trying to recall if this was actually the first time I was invited to something that was led to have a conversation regarding people that I've served and that I'm trying to help others serve as a physio in 30 years. That's actually led by the people we serve, not by the people who are doing the work who think we know it all. So I think as Keith mentioned, um, if you follow me on social media, you basically know everything you need to know, including my Beastie Boys, my music preferences, and the fact that I'm always looking for healthcare to re-examine and re-look, right, at, yes, how, how do we take this research and apply it to this actual person instead of going, here's the research, apply it, and it was like, whoa, I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure I'm ready for that because I don't even understand what I read, and the person I'm standing next to is telling me something completely different and I'm going to kind of go with them. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, I just, I don't know, after 30 years being in the business and being in the business of healthcare, you got to love that. Trying best to, you know, I've created something in my, my mission and lead that I lead with is what's best for the patient is actually best for business. So I am really thankful for this opportunity to be around the people doing this work um, who have been patients, who are people who have been served and from both sides. So I thank you all. I'm in Philadelphia. Um, currently, I go between each coast. So funny to be on here with people that are just a little further east than me on this uh, in North America. So it's pretty funny. I think I'm about as far east as you can go. And I'm like, oh, no, oh, no, they're further east. So it's cool. So I appreciate, again, both you, one, for taking the time to put this on and two, for inviting me. So appreciate it. Well, thanks, Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah. So um, what I'm going to do is go straight over to, listen, before I go over to uh, Bronnie, uh, I just want to just put a couple of sentences in myself, really, because I think uh, mean, the word, the actual term, uh, meaningful movement, I got. I have to be totally honest, It's this is um, a fairly new, uh, fairly new concept, really, or the wording, really, meaningful movement, because, listen, I'm, I'm a bit old school. You know, I was, it was all just um, stretching and exercising, stretching, exercising. And I think uh, it may be, I can't remember if I got uh, learned about this new term, mo meaningful movement, from either Keith or Bronny, I can't remember now. But at the beginning, I'm thinking, what the, what a uh, meaningful movement? It's just stretching, exercising, man. You know, and that's, that's what got me, that's what got me better, like, you know. But the more um, I heard about it, the more, See, this is me. See, I'm I'm a, I'm a slow learner. 
That's why it took me so long to get manage my pain and whatnot. But the the actual term when when I started hearing it explained more and more, I thought this, yeah, I get it now, you know. And I know Bronny's going to go into why why it's called meaningful movement. But just say, uh, you know, um, I just it, it, it was very strange for me because I think, as I say, being it's just that I'm an old school thinker, I guess. Like it's just what I've been brought up with. But I'm really digging digging this term because I think, uh, in fact, I'm now using it more and more, and pulling other people up about it, like healthcare professionals who are talking about just exercise this, that, and the other, like you know, because it ain't, you know, as Bronnie will explain, it's just it's just not just not about doing stretching, exercising. So Bronnie, if I hand over to you, then we'll all come in and I dare say have a put our uh, pennies worth in. Thanks so much, Pete. So, so it's really because this body, this is an exercise free zone. Because I get bored. <laughs> I absolutely get bored with exercise. And the people that I worked with in my clinical career, most of them hadn't done exercise, didn't care for it. I'm not working much clinically at the moment. They didn't care for it. It was not part of their life. And they come in to pain management and all of a sudden there's this expectation that you're going to go and do three sets of 10 every day, <laughs> come hell or high water, usually in a gym and with the watchful eye of a physiotherapist. <laughs> we used to call them physioterrorists. And, you know, there's a, there's a thing about that. And then... As people left our pain management program, I, I worked in a tertiary pain management service, um, and they'd go away and they'd drop the exercise because it never fitted in. So there's a couple of things about this whole idea is of exercise. One was that you know we do it to correct deficits. That that's what that's the purpose. The other is that it was about um, people are deactivated and deconditioned generally unfit therefore if you do lots of exercise that's got to be good for you because you know you must and then the whole narrative of exercise is medicine kind of hit and to my mind that's a bit weird sorry guys <laughs> because really bodies are meant to be lived in and used and what i can see is that remember COVID remember lockdowns we all yeah Amy really remembers COVID but remember lockdowns and all of a sudden I was working with patients at the time they were saying but I can't do my exercise because exercise was this thing that they did it was a component it was separated from their life it was a thing that they did in a particular setting and when that wasn't available, they didn't do it. And, and they didn't know what to do, which was even worse. And so I kind of thought, well, my life is about movement. I, I move all the time. You'll see me jiggle. It's about the things that I do every day that make me feel like I've got a body I can inhabit and enjoy and relish. And here's this bunch of people that I'm working with who are seeing it as a necessary evil that they'll do when they're being watched and we know with chronic pain that it's likely to hang around right it's going to be there well my fibro hasn't moved if anything it's got a bit worse over time so the likelihood is that people are going to need to use their movement practices for life and I don't know about you, but when I was in my 20s, I did different kinds of things. I had little kids and I had a little bit less time, but my body was probably a little bit more flexible than it is today. And what I do today, I'm older, I don't have my kids, I've got other things that occupy my time. And what I'm looking for in meaningful movement are practices that people can do for the rest of their life as an integral part of being a human with a body and yeah my body gets cranky and grumpy and so I want to have a, um, a menu a repertoire of things that I can do that involve my body movement for me 
walking the dog, doing the gardening, going kayaking, climbing a hill. Usually I prefer to go downhill rather than up, but I lost that bet with my partner. He likes going up. He says, you've got to earn the view, just chopping me to the top, right? But anyway, um, and, I, and I dance. And dancing's been my thing forever. And kind of, if I can enjoy all those things and do them in different forms throughout my life, I'm likely to do them. And I think the same thing applies to pretty much anybody that I know. Maybe the form of the movement changes over time as our bodies change and we, you know, some of us have to wear spectacles and, you know, we have different interests and pursuits and we maybe don't want to do competitive stuff. We just want to do stuff because it feels good. And what I'm, when I'm thinking about this meaningful movement concept, I'm thinking about how can we help people with pain find ways to move their body that embraces what your body can do, brings life to life, gets people to relish and savor the feeling of how great your body feels when it's doing stuff and bring all those health benefits without this prescriptive, you will do three sets of 10 in the gym under the supervision that people then just drop. Because that's my experience. So I'll, I'll stop there. The research supports me, by the way. I'm not going to, I won't put that in here but you know Jerry and I can talk about that <laughs> anyway I leave it open to you you other guys what are your thoughts about it Sorry, I just want to I just want to jump in a little bit because I just want to add to that and then turn it over to the experts here who are everybody but me um I I, I just I love all of that Bronnie and to pick up what you said with the with the physio and it being prescribed in three sets of 10 and all that um what I would add to that and what what really bothers me in the healthcare setting is then when that doesn't, when that isn't successful for the person, for all of these reasons, it doesn't meet their lifestyle or they just hate it. Then in their chart, it is yeah. charted as they failed. They failed Not physio. They failed. All of those, all of those things where it's now the person's fault, instead of saying this isn't, maybe this isn't the right methodology or the right way to, to help them because, so that just, irritates the few healthy nerves that I have left in my body. So anyway, I just now turn that over to others. <laughs> right. There is you said, and forgive me, I'm jumping in. I don't know if we have to put our hands That's up. That's fine. No, 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 <laughs> you are the expert, Keith, because you're living with pain and, you know, you're part of this uh, pain community. You're, you're well known in Canada and abroad and you're all experts in it, right? For various reasons and looking through different lenses, right? Uh, I'm happy I'm the only MD here because, you know, uh, I'll be brave enough to say that I don't think that pain care should be MD centric. It, it really, it really becomes MD centric and it really mm -hmm. focuses on biological, but really we need to get away from that. Um, and that's my two cents worth just based on your, your comments are key being an expert. Wow. So. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. <laughs> I find an interesting phenomena that I know was part of like my, you know, recovery. I was heavily dependent on physical therapy, which is why I ended up getting the degree um, in it. But this, I call it box checking, that we're doing things to do things, not because they have meaning. And if we're, if we're looking at pain through the lens of a nervous system being happy or discontent, right? I see people like stuck on this two times a day, three sets of 10, like they have to do it. And if they don't do it, they're harming themselves. They're not trying. They're like, all, and it's not, it's not about the exercise. It's about everything that they've attached mm -hmm. to this prescription mm -hmm. and what it means if they do or don't do it. And, and like, I, it makes me crazy. Cause I'm like, how about we just forget that? And what is it that you want to do? And for whatever reason, last year, I had a bunch of people that wanted to ride horses. So it was like, okay, then we need to do things that simulate riding horses if we're too afraid to actually get on the horse. So I just don't understand why as a whole, we're not doing the thing that you want to do to get to the thing you want to do, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But this, the whole culture of, physio physical therapy 
seems to be prescriptive, corrective, uh, whether we're correcting muscle imbalances or alignment or whatnot. And I, un, unless and until we get that word out that, hey, it's about moving your body in meaningful ways. Like, I don't really see how four-way leg raises on a table are going to translate to anything functional in your life. Like, great that you can do them. That's terrific. How does that help you go grocery shopping? Yeah. Got Amy, it. What, sorry. <laughs> sorry, someone else was talking first. Go ahead. David, all I you. Go on, go, yeah, on dive. go ahead, David. Yep. You know, Amy, what I'm hearing you saying, and, and it's resonating with me, and it's kind of bringing me back to a, a point in my training, you know, the, the, the movement or the activity has to be rewarding and meaningful to the patient, right? We really have to tap into the patient's values, right? It's about yes. their individual values, their culture, their beliefs, their spiritualism, right? Um, once upon a time in my training, um, a lecturer really was hammering home this concept of an exercise prescription, an exercise prescription. You've got to give them an exercise prescription. And while, while the term, you know, had a buzz and it sounded great in that mm -hmm. you know, environment, really, is that the right thing to do? Because, you know, a lot of pain patients have a kinesiophobia. Um, they have a very, you know, real fear of movement and to prescribe mm -hmm. exercise, like you folks are saying, you know, three sets of 10, or you got to go to the gym, you got to do X, Y, and Z. You know, we're, we're, we're not trying to turn out, you know, chronic pain patients turn bodybuilders. We're, we're trying to bring value to people's lives, right? Yeah. Um, so I definitely hear you in, in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I echo the same thing. You know, if you don't enjoy it, you're not, not going to set us up for success. And as someone who uh, was a marathon runner, and then I get to this point and I can't do this anymore, then it became hard to find out what can I do that I'm going to enjoy? And, you know, and, and to learn, and maybe just going back to that meaningful movement can be just a five minute walk. Wouldn't I have loved to see a physiotherapist walk out the door with me and go for a walk? Because then you also are building connections. Mm. Like there's so much more that we can do to help the person uh, get a better mindset and function and, and feel better. And you could think, you know, that would be just probably a lot more than sitting them on the table and just like you said, do the three steps of 10 or go over there on the treadmill. And, yeah. You need an OT then because we, we go walking. <laughs> we, we do the real world stuff. Jerry, go for it. Three so years. Like for, for three years, I was in the world of OTs and physio and not one walked at the door with me. Not one did something with me. Not oh, one. That's yeah. Sad. It's a lonely little world. <laughs> yeah. But it's, yeah. I'm hearing Jen, Jerry sort of biting his. Yeah, I know. I want to hear what Jerry has to say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, we, we, we don't have a system to support this, you guys realize, right? So I'm going to speak to the states, right? So I'm going to speak from the inside the system side of which, right, that I'm trying to impact in some ways. But we don't have a <laughs> system to support. Um, managing people like this well let, 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 let's let's say it we're recording this this mm -hmm. is going out to the whole world we some of the stuff we won't get paid for right so let's mm -hmm. just say that mm -hmm. so that that's what i'm sitting here and right and thinking about uh er, what everybody shared um so setting up this system because i don't think it's hard to i, I don't think it's hard to make it more about the person that we need remember i'm speaking from inside the system mm -hmm. i don't think it's hard to make because i've done it i've done it and i think i've impacted i believe i've impacted things by by putting together better questions asked earlier about this person about virginia who's going to schedule an appointment at 10 30. you know what can we what can we start to gather so that when she arrives her provider this person who is going to help serve her is a little more aware and better prepared for Virginia to start to do these things that you guys are talking about. I think it's possible and I don't think it's very difficult yet within this system, then, you know, how do people get paid for it? You see that and, and where do productivity standards fit in all this? So, you know, it's, which is great because then let me go back to why I'm so happy to be here. Right. And then I think of seeing Pete, right. I've been interacted with Pete on Twitter probably since, first bluebird probably I, th I think somewhere peter we probably connected within the first couple of years of twitter being there yeah. 
And, you know, and I see Peter talking about, right, he posts his pictures of being in the garden. And then I know Peter is a pain person, right? We'll just use that term. And I see him from the garden. I see him talk about his motorcycle. I see him at the gym. I see him walking in the coffee shop. So to me, I'm going to finish this with, again, I'm going to circle back to that if we, if we allow these people to speak and share their experiences, that that is going to do more to this system than anything I can do from the inside. The, the system ain't going to be changed from the inside. So, um, but yet if, if I as a person can make people more aware of, of Pete and what he's doing and working with other, Pete knows I love sharing all his stuff where he goes at providers, not at, I shouldn't say goes at providers, I'm sorry. He engages with providers online when they start to say things about how they treat their patients. And Pete says stuff. I love Pete coming in and saying, well, have you thought about you know, self-management? Are you teaching people, right? <laughs> this is the change to get to where we on the inside will better understand how we can serve these people showing up. I'd be so curious, Virginia, and I would love I would love if we could somehow go back to every first encounter you had with every one of those providers and went through, and I would love to be a fly on the wall and hear the questions they asked of you. Well, it'll be the we all know. subjective and then the objective. Yeah, I, we I'm all really know how the, we all know. Yeah, and so, you know, and yet if this same person has had exposure, even outside of the system, to other people and, and been engaged in other ways, you know, and then saying, by the way, I am a physio, so I'll, I'll own this. I can't tell you, I, I can't tell you with 100% certainty. I ask people what's important to you most of the time. I'm, I will own that I probably was not even asking people. And something as simple in a whole hour never said what's important to you. I mean, so, do you not I, think it comes to the lack of knowledge within the system about what chronic pain is about you know you can move with pacing or the boom bus you know you you can't do that or if you're going to be in bed for the next day you know that's that's not good movement and i think there's a little bit of that in there too in the belief that chronic pain is even real so that kind of go, um, comes into it because the movement has to be set up for success you got to set us up for success and that that is about Yes, choosing the right type of movement. And I, I kind of talk about scaffolding. Rehabilitation's really scaffolding. Let's make it easy. We'll simplify it and have a structure. But rehab isn't just that. The whole, you know, health professionals see this person in this moment. We live our whole lives, this longitudinal thing. So this professional sees us at this moment. They do the scaffolding around us and they... They, they kind of, once they've done that bit, then they're done. But we carry on and what we take are these beliefs and understandings that we develop. Now, I think we can, as health professionals, support people to learn stuff about themselves that enables them to go on independently. One of them is not to give us rules about what your body movements ought to look like, but instead to help us to experience our own bodies and make our own decisions about what movements feel good and what movements don't feel so good. So that, and, and allow us to experiment with all sorts of different ways of moving, like different ways of lifting something, different ways of walking, different places to walk so that, we're, and, and noticing all the time, what does it feel like? Get your own body feedback. So that when you're released from the care of, of any professional, as a person with pain, you've got more confidence to trust in your own body. Because I don't know, a number of people I've seen who really distrust their own body. They don't believe what their body is, is about. They've been told what it ought to be like. You've got you know, an unstable pelvis or you've got this terrible back or you've got a weak core and then they try to do something like tense the core while you're moving and you know what it's really hard to do that and when I ask a patient to you know let's try that movement one with your know, tense core you know, just engage the core and then one without which one feels more free more flexible which one could you do in lots of different settings 
And you know what? It's not the tenth core, I can tell you that. So to help us as professionals to help this person get to know their body and to listen to what their body's saying. No, not pain as your guide. Let's notice when it feels more comfortable, when it doesn't feel more comfortable, and then take that learning experimentation out into daily life in between sessions and then come back and I ask people to take photos show me where you've been walking show me all the places you've been in this week um, show me all the things that you've done so that we can see that you're generalizing the confidence that we've just started to develop in clinic out into your world and when I talk about that scaffolding that's about let's simplify the task let's make it simple to start off with just walking for example and walking on a flat surface to start off with because that's you know reasonably easy and then next week let's try walking on gravel or a slippery surface you know and just grade it so that people are gaining that confidence and we're there going yay you did it and show us you know getting the person to show them to show us what they've been doing how awesome is that and I think you can do that even side you know a system that says you've got to do this type of procedure we just don't call it homework because if you do I won't do it it's experiments there look try this out have a go be See curious yeah be curious investigate experiment be playful um yeah I'll just throw that out there I just want to that'll help with the distraction piece sorry to oh yeah yeah I actually send people out geocaching I don't know if you guys have learned about geocaching geocaching it's a it's a game it's about finding locations using your GPS on your phone and there will be a hidden container there and you go find it but because your GPS doesn't take you precisely to the right space and because geocaches are a little bit cunning and they disguise the hidey holes there's a bit of a game there great with kids great for adults my partner went out yesterday and spent his time geocaching the cool thing is that you're out there doing something you could be out there shrooming or you could be out there just being mindful who cares as long as you're there doing it yeah stop sorry I just wanted to pick up on a couple of things and it, and it goes to something, you know, what you said, David, and then what you said, um, Jerry, because one of the things I don't think we can dismiss is the fact that, that we work and live within healthcare systems and system changes is difficult. Um, and Jerry, you were talking about from being within the system. And I think one of the fundamental things that we need, we, I don't know who the collective we need to, to work on is to chip away at system change. And David, you said, you know, you're, you're doing work, you know, we're starting to see, thank you for the work on the undergrad and the graduate program through the faculties of medicine. Um, I have opportunities now to guest lecture at UBC to both the masters of physical therapy and hopefully the med students this year. Um, so it's the slow inroads, but what you're doing, David, is the big inroads. But Jerry, when you said the system doesn't pay for this, we need to recognize that. And instead of saying that stupid, we need to work on changing the system so that we educate those that build the education systems to say, we will pay you to do this because this is the right thing to do because it's a business and I work in private industry. And if we're not making money, I can't pay my employees and that's a bad thing. So it's not a bad thing to make money. And in Canada, we have a socialized healthcare system, but my PT isn't part of socialized healthcare. I have to go out and pay for that on my own in Canada. So let's recognize that the business side of this is as you know, it, it's, it's there, it's part of what we do. So let's change the education system so that it's incorporated into schools, into practice. So the physiotherapists out there are like, I do get paid to take you for a walk, or I do get paid for the things that we need to do instead of saying, well, that's dumb and it doesn't work. We, I mean, that's a big change, but I, I think it's one of the things we also need to work on, so. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Um, yeah. And <clears throat> I, Bronnie brought up something. So here, let's talk about this within the context of what you just said. Bronnie brought up something that has really impacted me over probably the last couple of years is understanding this journey. You talked about the journey, Bronnie, uh, and, mm -hmm. and we see these people in this part of the journey. 
And what I'm trying to help my businesses understand that I'm working with is, can we, can we broaden a little more and how then, then I'm, I, I, I don't necessarily, I don't claim to have the solution for this, but I, I say first, we have to acknowledge we're only doing this right on the, mm. on the intake when, when they're in the clinic, everything, we're just doing this. I'm like, can we do this? Can we start here and understand that we, we are a part of a, we, we are a tiny, right? It's like Horton hears a who. We're a tiny part of this person's journey. We must learn more about where they've come from and where they want to go, right? And it's not just, what are your goals, right? How long has this been going on? You know, how long has this been going on? Two years. By the way, any provider on here knows if you're sitting across from someone, they go, it's been going on for a long time. You start to question, do I even want to know? Do I even want to ask, right? Which is... Mm -hmm which is unfortunate as hell, but we, we have to learn more about this journey, right? So this is part, to me, this is part of the education is we, we've got to put together systems. And by the way, I'll only speak for the states. David already alluded to it a little bit, so I'm going to pile on. We have huge egos, if anybody didn't know. Um, if I, I don't know, maybe this is the first time you're hearing it, but we got huge egos in healthcare. Right. And I think you guys know from the stuff I share, it's like if we actually engage and let these other very wise people on the team who maybe don't have initials behind their name play a part in this person's journey. I say this every day. I'm using this journey word every day. If we if, if we allow this intake process to start to gather information about the journey so that again, that so that the physio, the OT, Amy's ready when you walk in the door, then she continues to build out this story, we can call it, of their journey so she can better serve them. And then we even put the systems in place of how are we going to do the follow-up? And then which mm -hmm. gets into this other thing I want to address, and I'll stop talking here, is that there is this drive in the States, and I stopped using the word self-efficacy, and I've actually looked at it as a dirty word because we use it, Keith, against the patients. Mm, yeah. And man, Twitter really, really lit me up on this, or I should say enlightened me and then lit me up on this. And because I see people that a lot of people respect, right? Providers and things within our profession, using this term self-efficacy as a way to get rid of patients quickly. And if we look yeah. at people on a journey, I'm like, when do we, I, I like the Sherpa, I call it the Sherpa mindset. I'm not the one who ever used it first, but right, the Sherpa, I'm like, you know, who's climbed Mount Everest the most and whatever name you hear, you're wrong because there was some Sherpa who's been up there twice as many times. Right? Right. <laughs> so the Sherpa is this person that knows the journey, understands a journey, but doesn't need to be in the forefront like we do in healthcare. So if we start to take this Sherpa mentality, we don't think getting rid of someone qu as quick as possible is the act is the only sign of success. Then we can start to explore the journeys a little more we can start to set up the education a little different and we can actually start to say what's important to you and then actually do something about it so yeah that a lot of stuff wrapped up in there but i heard lots of good things and i wanted to bring it back together just with a lot of the thoughts i have of how do we improve this experience for people there's a lot of things in there but are we, are we focusing as clinicians on the wrong thing? We're thinking oh, about the form of the exercise. I don't think that's the thing, whether it's the skill, the pacing skill, or the, you know, the mindfulness or the exercise. What we, I think, as health professionals need to focus better on is the person's ability to have a repertoire, things that they can do, a set of, have a smorgasbord, of skills, strategies, things. And then what we teach is the skill to stop and think and make your own mind up about what you're going to use here and now. That's the, I call it metacognition. So it's that process that perhaps we really are working on. Yeah, self-efficacy is important. You've got to be confident that when you do it, it's going to work. But actually, if you never get to know that you can choose, Mm -hmm. what's the point you know if you think that what you have to do are these type of exercises or this form of mindfulness and you never get to stop and think hold on what I really want to do in this moment then you never develop the ability to transfer what you learn in theory 
in the clinic with whomever you're seeing into your world. Because I tell you what, when I'm doing my grocery shopping, it's, um, it's not the same as being in a physio clinic. You know, there are howling children screaming around with those little tiny, tiny shopping trolleys, grabbing stuff off the shelves and having tantrums. And it's noisy and I'm tired because it's the end of the day and I know I've got to get this done before I get, you know, in that moment, I've got to be able to stop and think, now what is going to help me achieve my goal right now and get home and then live my life? Because that's my life, right? How much are we teaching that as health professionals? Is that the skill instead of, oh, you know how to pace, you know how to do exercise, you know... That's not, you know, I know how to do them, but the knowledge of when, where, how, and why, and how I can vary them, that's living with your pain and skills. Are we focusing on the wrong thing in rehab? Oh, absolutely. Mm. I, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, with, I mean, without a doubt. I, one of the things that I've started in, in my six-month program with my people is... I, I went back and looked through my PTA notes. I know that's a little silly, but I was like, okay, what did what did this random school decide was important for me to know as a PTA, right? And the said principle really stuck out. Mm. Specific adaptation to impose demands. Because we need it for sitting, getting out of bed, showering, grocery shopping, right? It's it's we, we need to adapt to what it is that we want to do. And I, and I started thinking, okay, I, I, I've got all these people that are doing all kinds of, you know, I had one woman that was doing 60 minutes of PT exercises a day and felt like she could not break away from that or she was going to fall apart. Hmm. And so having to, like helping somebody like that restructure what you're hmm. doing. And, and by teaching, you know, a random percentage, right? Because we're guessing in the clinic anyway, like- yeah. Sorry, folks, those of you listening, your clinicians are making educated guesses about what your next step up should be. Yeah, thanks, then, Amy. I like that. <laughs> no problem. But if, if I can teach you to do that with your walking, with going back to the gym, with, you know, your length of sitting, whatever, and it doesn't matter what your thing is. If I can give you a, a scale, increase by 10%, increase by 25%. If it goes wrong, decrease, right? If I can give you a formula, you can do whatever the heck you want with that formula. And I don't understand because we could get reimbursed for that, Jerry, while we're teaching people, you know, we're going to use this exercise in clinic, but I'm going to teach you what I'm doing so that you can do this with anything. Yes. Love it. And can I just jump in here? It's just, it's, it, I'll tell you what. This is this is this is this is awesome, mate. Uh, every, I'm I'm enjoying every moment because I'm sitting here and I, I'm getting neck ache because I'm I'm nodding myself, nodding for everybody. <laughs> I think I think we're all it's, it's the frustration of it all, and um, and I think I think we have to remember that we're having to unravel things that you know. But when people they, they get start getting a pain problem straight away, you know, I, I know I sound, I'm going to sound like a bit of an, a broken record again, but they get anchored into whatever they're in the driving seat, then they're taken out of the driving seat, put in the passenger seat, and they become some sort of health tourist within, you know, where you know whatever country they're in, whatever what's going on with it, the service, local uh, medical service. So. Once, once, of course, when, when we're in a passenger seat, which is so we do the tourist thing and whatnot, as I did back in the day, <clears throat> and um, and we we we, we stuck we stayed there for a number of can be months and you know for a lot some people many years, and I think we we got to remember as well that um, the within their respective medical schools they're still taught this old uh, way of doing stuff like you know um you know about when you have i mean it, it, the, the problem the main problem is i know dave you're doing some stuff up there it sounds cool excuse me is um they're not you know the, the actual term self-management meaningful movement 
isn't why it's not even in their curriculum it's not even on their vocabulary because it's all about you know finding out what the problem is uh, and it, they have to treat them or do something to them and you know what you know or some sort of medication and, and uh rct that says this is this is the package yeah you have to do that for an yeah, rct yeah, yeah. They, they, yeah. they're taking that package and then yeah. using it and, as it, if it's real yeah and i and it's like i think it, i call it victorian victorian learning mm, yeah because it's um well we've always done it this way because it's the way of it's like how you move an army around you've got a the reason why they have to march this way because it's like whatever they do in the in the march in the, in the parade ground is what they've got to do they've got to work as a team when they're in a battlefield or whatever like you know so it's so one one way of getting people from one area to another area in a way it's a little bit like that in medical school where they're all being trained into a certain way so that when they go out there they're all supposed to know what you know everybody knows what everybody else is doing the thing is i mean i if that system works it's it well it don't because um when i when i first started doing this when i started getting involved with this back in the, in the mid 90s in the uk i don't know what it is around the, in the other country or where you guys are but uh, when I say there was only 7.8 million people in the UK living with pain, which to me back then thought, I mean, that, that is off the, off the chart. But now, now, now they're talking about 28 million. Now, we, you know, I, I keep asking myself, well, what, why is it with all this stuff that I see on social media about doing this, that and the other with meaningful movement and all this, you know, why why is it all the, um, we've supposedly got more people now involved with pain and what or whatever why is it all why the numbers keep creeping up like you know why have we got this um opioid problem and, and whatnot like you know and to me it's the same thing with this with the exercise business or the meaningful you know it's it's it is to me i mean i'm 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 uh i'm a i'm a great massive believer now in meaningful movement you know because as, as amy says it's if you if the person chooses a movement that they enjoy doing they're more likely to keep keep it going like you know and it's just doing everyday stuff but it's that you know as i was i was conditioned you know when i first started seeing a physio back in the right at the beginning it was, it was do 10 of these 10 of these and and when, when you got up to you got, I got up to sort of you know, got up to six five or six so I, my pain level shot up and i was saying to myself i, I need this like i need another pair of ear rolls you know <laughs> you know there's just something going well uh, but it's still going on now like you know so it's i think whoever's hopefully people from medical school are listening to this or watching this is that you've got you've got to change like you know because we can't it can't carry on like this it's about finding out what a person enjoys or what enjoys doing as you say bronnie whether you're you know uh um, you know whatever they want to do like you know i mean i'll i'll i've been mixing it up like you know i was doing i go I go down the gym for two reasons, like because one, it's because it's social. That was sometimes I don't see anyone, like you know, but I go down there. But I like going down there. I mean, but I do exercises before I go down the gym. I cut when I'm down there, uh, and I'm doing stuff all throughout the day. I've just got back into doing qi kung now for some reason. Well, it's, it's come out of the blue, and I'm really digging out and enjoying that. So it's all it's about finding. And I, uh, if you enjoy, it, you're going to carry on doing it. And you know, it's as simple as that. And if you got a, um, if you got a, they're cranking out. You got to go to the gym. You know, <laughs> might as well. Why don't you just send it, send people to prison? <laughs> you know, because you because know, that's it is. It, it it's like it, it's like you, you incarcerating yourself really. So, and I saw someone. I was coming home from the gym yesterday, and I saw a lady. She must have had a. a it was actually bought. She was doing exercises by, on the on the on the pavement uh or a sidewalk as you would say by the river and her coach was getting her and she was uh, doing exercises when she was lying down doing sit-ups and stuff like that you know so <laughs> but it's it's if, if she's digging it oh fantastic you know but it's finding out you know i i, I to me I, I i nothing personal to you to the to you guys in, in medical lane like you know but I, I, um it's self-management is I don't I can't see what the problem is it's it's just I call it a simple program for complicated people but we haven't complicated it we've we've been complicated you know 
I think I said to Keith yesterday, like, you know, when, if you've got not, not just pain, but other health conditions, you know, dealing with all this stuff, like it's like jumping spaghetti. Yeah. <laughs> and we can't, you know. And the thing is, as well, one last thing before, I'll, I'll sort of hand back, but it's, um, uh, which I bloody forgot now. It's, it's all getting old business, it ain't no fun, like, you know. Um, is, uh, oh, I can't bloody remember now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll end back anyway. If it comes back, I'll come back to you. <laughs> I'd, 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 I'd like to pick up from, from what you had there, Pete. And, and David, I'd like to ask you, because you are, and thank you for being here as the, quote, only medical person. And I, it's, it's great to have your perspective. And you're working in the field. You're in the clinic every day. You're sitting in the hospital as we speak. We understand. Um, what's it like for you? Uh, do you introduce the concepts of meaningful movement to people and, and how is that received? And, and what is it from, from their side when, if, and when you have these conversations? Well, that's a long chat, but you know, <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> yeah. I've got a lot of thoughts going through my head as I'm listening to you guys and I'm thinking, I got to interject and I got, I got to say something because there's so much good stuff being said here. Um, so Keith, I'll answer your question. Then I'm going to, I'm going to come back to something that Amy said. So I, I do introduce it. And, you know, hmm. so I didn't say at the beginning here, like my initial training was as an anesthesiologist, right? So, oh. but I'm not a, I'm not an interventional person. I, you know, I, I, I'm pain medicine. I sit in the office and I, and I say to my colleagues and I say to my patients, like, I really feel like a primary care provider when I'm in the office, right? This has nothing to do with my anesthesia training whatsoever. Uh, and so I do introduce those concepts of self-management and meaningful movement and, you know, in Canada, I don't know if there's a different term in the States or in New Zealand or, or the UK, but, you know, the stepped care model um, that's being introduced for chronic diseases, right? Not just pain, but but all chronic diseases, you know, that identifies at the bottom of the pyramid self-management, right? Um, so I think, you know, Pete, that's a great idea for a future talk. I've got a fantastic Canadian expert on uh, step care and, and self-management that we can bring on to the show. Um, you know, and... and Sometimes it's it's received well. Sometimes it's received uh, with skepticism, mm -hmm. fear, mm -hmm. um, doubt. You know, what are you, yep. you talking? I'm, I'm here to get a mm -hmm. pill. I'm here to get mm -hmm. like some kind of service um, so that I, you know I got to go, and, but I need to be fixed, right? Yep. Um, so I actually, Keith, I, this is a kind of good inroad to because I was going to kind of pose questions if I could to the panel to hear what your opinions are. So th there's a um a, a one pager that was put out by the um college of family physicians of canada and it's about meaningful movement okay for chronic pain patients and one thing going back to amy and to brony's comments about you know regimented care and regimented movement is you know i don't care if the patient goes ballroom dancing i don't care if they go for a stroll with their friends the patient has to be their own cheerleader and you know president of their fan club and what i say to them is you know you go do whatever that activity is, right? Because that activity may be, not, that might not be of value to me. And that's not what's important. It's what's of value to you. And you rate your overall sense of well being before and after. Mm -hmm. And if your overall mm -hmm. sense of well being after that activity is improved, well, then we have a win, right? So that's how I, that's how I approach it. Okay. And so a lot of questions come up and Keith, it, it, this is serendipitous that you asked that question and, and, and you guys tell me to be quiet when I've taken up too much time. Some of the, on this one pager for the College of Family Physicians Canada, it, it looks at barriers to meaningful movement when you're having these discussions with patients. And it's one of the questions, I'll, I'll go through each one and maybe we can talk about them. You know, um, the patient will answer more activity is going to cause me more pain. How do we get past that barrier? I'll, 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 I'll call them out all here and then we'll, maybe we can chat about them. I'm active, but then I pay for it later. I'm so out of shape, it would take me forever to get back in shape, right? With that one, I say, no, this is not about getting in shape. I, I mentioned earlier, you know, we're not we're not trying to churn out, you know, amateur bodybuilders here. We're, tr we're trying to churn out improved, you know, health measures and health-related quality of life, right? So this is about improving your well-being and your quality of life, not, not to get you in shape, right, by definition. Um, I tried to do exercises for my pain before. They didn't help. That doesn't work for me, mm -hmm. right? Roadblock. Um, if I can't do it like I used to do it, then why am I going to bother, right? Okay. Uh, if I feel any pain, that must be bad. I'm hurting something. I'm causing more damage. So, you know, you guys have all heard this mm -hmm. before, right? 
But these are the things that are going to come up from across my desk, your desk, doesn't matter what you do, right? Um, you're going to hear these things, right? So it, I'd be interested to hear, you know, what you how you guys approach these things. But Keith, like, I, I really kind of sit back and this is going to bring you into the comment about the systems uh, issues that Jerry brought up, right? In primary care, you know, not to talk about uh, payment models or remuneration for providers, because that's not what people want to hear. That's not what patients want to hear. But it really does inform and impact how we deliver care, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I know here in Newfoundland right now, our, our um, primary care colleagues, uh, our GPs are having issues with uh, billing for chronic disease care, right? It's, mm -hmm. You know, there is a, a code for it, but they don't get paid for it because of all sorts of, you know, red tape, mm -hmm. you know, if you're going to provide chronic disease care, whether that's talking about meaningful movement, talking about someone's feelings, talking about how they're just doing in life, what are you struggling with? There should be a payment model so that you could spend as much time as you bloody well need to with that patient and not have to worry about the 15 minute increments and the 80 people in the weight room, because that's just terrible care. And when the government gets that through their head, maybe we'll make some inroads, right? Um, so where was I going with that? Um, you know, I, I would I would love as a specialist to be able to sit in a room like I did with a patient today with, you know, severe rheumatoid arthritis pain and talk for two hours, right? You know, but you don't get paid. Now, I, I do spend an hour with them. We get paid for 15 minutes or something, but, you know, you spend the time. Um, but it'd be nice to have you know, even for the physios, the OTs, the social workers to have a mechanism to be remunerated for the work, right? Let's just call it the work. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm, I'm blabbing, but uh, you know, those barriers, when we I talk have about- I solution. <laughs> okay, <laughs> one second. Wow. So, <laughs> those, those barriers, uh, you know, I, I just, I tell people, Keith, and I hope I'm answering your questions. I say, mm -hmm. listen, you know, again, I'm a bit of a broken record here, but I say like, this is not about what I believe in when it comes to mm -hmm. movement and self-management. It's what you believe in, right? And I, you, you heard me say earlier, it's about their beliefs, it's about their spiritualism, it's about their culture, right? And that mm -hmm. all has to inform what's, you know, how you're going to approach each individual patient, right? So I just say to them, listen, if it's important to you, if it makes you smile, if it makes you feel better, if it lightens your mood, et cetera, so on and so forth, that's what we're going to focus on, right? That's that's awesome. Thank you for bringing up those. I would love to see that paper. I haven't seen that uh, that document, so I'm going to get that from you. But I know others, and Amy, you want to jump in here, but I think it's important to recognize that from the the supporter healthcare side, you can be the most empathetic and connected, but if the person isn't in that place in their life, then you're going to run into these barriers that you just went through on the list there. So. Um, yeah, Amy, I know you had you wanted to jump in there, so please do. Mm -hmm. I did. So uh, I think the solution is it's peer support because there is simply. I, I was going to say I know it's Virginia, <laughs> but like I think about the time that I take with my clients because I'm a I'm a private chronic pain coach. That's that's the moniker I chose, and I think about the amount of time that I spend with my clients throughout a week, especially when they're brand new to me. No, but you can't do it. You, you, you cannot do that in a clinical setting. You just, you can't. But if, you know, if wishes were fish and the system was set up where you could have people like Bronnie and Virginia and Keith and Pete and myself that worked alongside your clients, holy cow, you got a winning system there because they also need community. And I'm just going to hmm. like, that off to Virginia there because I know that's her bag too but I really think that that is where the winning combination is is educated you know asides if you will and it runs almost like a sponsorship like a like a you know 12 step you mm -hmm. get buddied up with somebody that's been through it and is ahead of you in the journey that can do all of the things that our clinicians can't because of a thousand different reasons. It's not that you don't want to, it's the system is set up almost to hamstring you. And, and Virginia, do you have something to add? Because I was just thinking as you were talking, Amy, and I was listening to you, I was thinking at the same time, but those barriers that you listed off, uh, David, I was that guy, every single one, I said them. So, yep. yeah. 
Virginia? And, and, you know, Johnny, like, all those barriers and all those things, we, we've heard them all. We've heard them in the peer support and things like that. And I think as much as we need uh, health care, care and a system change, we need a change within ourselves. And it's a cultural change. No, you know, and something we get in the peer sort, support is that um, self-compassion. You know, it's that it's okay. I can't do this now anymore. I used to be able to, I can't, it's okay. I can't go to the gym. It's okay. If things have changed. And when you sit there and I think it's at the community and the peer support and you hear people say that it's like, all right, this person's only walking five minutes. Well, that's okay. And I think that's sometimes our own barriers is too, because we think we're going to be able to do what we used to be able to do. We, we, we've been raised. It's like, you know, what is it? No pain, no gain, you know, go, go. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a little bit of that, of uh, that self-compassion and understanding and being okay with ourselves. And I think that's often what we get a lot within the peer support groups too. That yeah. self-compassion, that's, that's beautiful, Virginia. I'm so glad you said it because I think many of us struggle with it. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm going to jump in really quick because Pete put in the chat about um, group care. Um, mm. If I'm not mistaken, and I don't want to be, We'll quote it. I know we're, we're recording here, but I believe in Alberta, um, as far as Canada is concerned, that there physicians can bill for group care, whether it's um, counseling or or what have you. I, I believe that's either there or coming down the pipeline. So, and keep me, keep, um, Pete, me if I made a comment that you know would save time and, and money, and for the right cohort of people that are you know consenting to be in front of others, you know. Uh, and talk about these things with others. I think it's a great mechanism to provide care. Um, Virginia, to your point about compassion, you know, talking to patients about meaningful movement and that what's important to them, uh, as we've discussed, you know, it's also important, you know, at a baseline to to really educate patients on, you know, what is chronic pain. So many patients have gone from provider to provider, uh, and you guys all know this, you know looking for the fix, right? Oh, go to the orthopedic surgeon. They'll, they'll have the answer. Go, go to Dave. He'll have the answer, you yeah. know? And yeah. it's just, it's just a, a, a turnstile for these poor people. And they, they have got it ingrained that, that there's going to be a fix or a cure. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we really need to get down, you know, to, to ground level into the weeds with them to, to help them understand their disease. Right. Uh, in Newfoundland, diabetes is, quite endemic. And so a lot of our population can really identify with diabetes. And I, I say to my patients, look, stop getting upset with yourself. Okay. If I was your GP right now, and I, I told you that you're a diabetic, you wouldn't expect me to cure it today. We would talk about next steps, treatment, lifestyle modification, et cetera, so on and so forth. That's how we need to approach this, right? So forget everything you learned from the 20 providers before me. We, we need to learn to accept what we are now, we need to accept that we have a chronic disease and that we're going to manage it, right? And that you're not yourself from 10 or 15 years ago. And there isn't going to be a cure, just as we can't cure that diabetes, right? Um, and like you said, have self-empathy, right? Don't feel guilty, right? You cannot control this as much as, in case in point, none of the 20 people you saw before me can control this. So how are you going to control this, right? So really getting down into the weeds with patients on that, I think is really valuable. And that's important to me. It's something that I do because if we don't have that framework, it doesn't matter what else I do because they're just going to think, okay, well, that guy doesn't know next, right? So. Mm -hmm. Can I add to that? When I posted on Twitter, X, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Facebook and stuff. And I've said, you know, chronic pain is a thing I have yet to find um open willingness amongst health professionals to say actually we don't do very much for chronic pain there's not a lot of humility out there yeah you're you guys yeah. Are yeah, we are a different group but out out there we don't even have research that tells us as clinicians the best way to tell somebody you've got chronic pain. I have not found anything that shows the best way to do that. We have lots in medical training about breaking bad news, about a life-limiting mm -hmm. illness around a, or a rare disease. But actually, the best way to say your pain is going to be there 
um, even my favorite pain physicians that I've worked with for many, many years say that they are a little afraid to say it's going to hang around because they don't want to remove hope. So we, have, we are working as clinicians in a void around the best way to have that conversation. And there's this enormous fear amongst particularly people who are in the pain reduction business of, um, of actually saying we've done what we can do. And that's across every profession that I can think of. It is hard for clinicians to say, this is what you have. And the reason I bring this up is because if as a clinician, you're scared of saying you've this person to this person, you've got chronic pain, you need to learn to live with it, you're not going to go there. And I, I presented to um, our Burwood Academy Trust, um, well, my PhD student did, and one of the guys there who's a peer support leader, he's in a wheelchair, he's, he's um, I think he's tetraplegic, and he said he doesn't like saying to people in wheelchairs, your pain is probably going to last. It's probably going, and that's his own experience. So I think two things. One is that as, as people living with pain, our job is to say we can live fabulous, amazing, wonderful lives in the presence of pain. So that we make that view much more prevalent. Because all we see in the media are these horror stories about how terrible it is to live with pain. And I know it is. And yet, at the same time, we can have these wonderful Look, we're connecting with people that I admire so much who live amazing lives. So we need to put some of that out there so that it's not seen as this death sentence or life sentence, should I say. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is that that community around clinicians who are working in this void, we as, as people living with pain, our job can also be about supporting those clinicians to feel more confident about what they do. Because if you are working in this area, I've done it for 30 years or so, and I've always felt I'm saying the same stuff for 30 years, and I'm still swimming against the current. How is that? And because clinicians are scared, they back off. We all do. And yet, if you read the qualitative research, People with pain say they would rather know that this is what you've got so they can grieve and let go and feel the pain of loss. So then you can you have room to start building the new. You can't do that when you're still hanging on to the old. So that's, I guess, we need some good research in this area. Yeah. Mm. Ronnie, I think you hit on like one of the pivotal things and David you you spoke to this in the way that you speak to patients so mm. thank you oh my god thank you but yeah. it's you get stuck in this holding pattern and I know Keith and I have talked about this in our own stories and and I've heard Virginia mention it too that you just you get stuck because you're being treated like it's acute and there's something that needs to be found yeah. Yeah. And it's just ongoing. And as soon as they find the thing, it'll be gone. Mm. In the meantime, you're not being the person you want to be, the spouse you want to be, the parent you want to be. Like all of these things are falling apart around you while you're waiting for the person to find the thing so that they can fix it. Mm -hmm. But you can't move forward until you grieve all of that, especially, you know, those that have been in pain for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Mm there's yeah. all of this coming to terms with like all of the stuff that happened between when the pain started and like when you finally realized mm -hmm. this isn't going to change and you don't need to have a psychologist take you through that you just need a human who wants to mm -hmm. be there and bear witness to and listen to you grieve i i, I yeah just yeah, yeah. absolutely Stop. <laughs> it's, it's a system thing and an education thing, isn't it? Like what, what we said before, right? Um, I was listening to a podcast yesterday, I think it was from the American Veterans Association, 
breaking it down to something that you just said, Amy, it, the simple definition or simple differentiation between acute and chronic, right? And this 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 VA podcast was talking about getting down uh, to undergraduate level and really educating on the difference, right? Because if they don't know the difference, and it seems so simple to us, right? Acute and chronic, right? We get that. Mm -hmm. But for, for the, 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 the newcomer med student, physiotherapist, occupational therapist, kinesiologist, they may not understand that, right? So that's the education piece, the the the, the system piece. Uh, I don't know how we're going to fix it, but you know, um, but you, you know, you don't need. Uh, I don't know what access is like where you are, but you don't need. No disrespect to my clinical psychologist or psychi psychiatry mm -hmm. colleagues, but you no, you don't need them. You do need a human, right? Um, yeah. uh, just a personal experience uh, from from this week, you know what anesthesiologist sits on a phone for half an hour with his 76 something you know, year old patient listening mm -hmm. to them talk about their frustrations about keeping up with their spouse or feeling guilty about not being able to maintain the household because that's their job I'm like, oh. you know walking them off that edge mm -hmm. right you know I did that this week and I tell you I know the patient felt better after because I could hear it in her voice she was getting emotional because she 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 was able to purge and let that out and and share those feelings with somebody because obviously she can't you know at home um and the conversation ended with can i come into the office with my spouse so that we can continue this conversation because i think that's really going to help me live better and i said that's absolutely you know you call like, two hours whatever you want an hour doesn't matter but you know i i think i'm digressing here but you know it's really important to have that human factor right so you don't need to have an MD, an RN, a PT. Doesn't we don't need that. You just need to be an empathetic provider, right? Mm -hmm. I so like I want to jump in here because here's here's my takeaway from today. And I believe this for some time now. And I think I've shared with this, right? If so if I understand people's journeys better, right? That I'll start to look at my role. Here we go in their journey differently. So my takeaway from this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this out loud because we're recording this and it's gonna go worldwide, is actually the solution isn't from within healthcare. And I think it's um, not, not to take away from anything you said, David, so this has nothing to do with what you've said, that this is my experience, is that actually, if we look to the system to change education to everything, we're gonna fail. I'm going to say it out loud because oh, this is the solution is not within our egos and what we bring to this. The solution is in the Virginias in the P and only because Amy and Bronnie, I don't know exactly bigger picture what you guys are doing, but I see Pete and I heard Virginia. It's actually in getting the word out to people that maybe your first step isn't into the healthcare system. Yeah. Maybe it's to find people like Virginia and Pete. And I mean, let's think about that for a second. Number one thing you got to do is just let go of the ego that we have to be the first person, right? And that possibly, and Bronnie has said, well, I think everybody is, has echoed this in some way or fed into this is, is if I can get you, you know, and this is something I've tried to build out on a front end for clinics of how do we get a better screening tool so people who aren't put on the schedule, I think, I, you know, Keith, maybe we've talked about this or Pete, but, you know, I say this thing, not everybody who calls today should be scheduled. Mm -hmm. And if you've done better work, right, if we take the blinders off, we understand there's a role of this intake person who doesn't have to have any initials behind their name to hear certain things, then maybe what I recommend to you is I know this person and her name is Virginia and she spends a lot of time and understands a lot about what you're sharing with me. I know Pete, right? And literally the referral is out to Pete and Virginia before, because by the way, I will tell you what the research shows in America. Once you get in the system, you're fucked, man. Everything goes down. Price goes up. Your outcome goes down, everything. I won't speak for Canada or anywhere else. Oh, you're you're so yeah. right. Jeff. You're, in America, you're... we got to own this and we got to own this now. So I, I truly believe that part of a big part of the solution is better upstream education, better upstream messaging, right? I'm doing some work with someone else um, currently, another provider, and we're going 
we're not going to the providers, right? Everybody wants to train the providers. Everything. We're going straight to consumer. And we are going to line up all these consumers in this certain area that we want to help these people in. And we're going to make sure they have all the resources they need. And guess what? A boatload of the resources have zero to do with the system, right? And if you look at what these people need, they need information earlier in their journey. I think we could all agree with that. Mm -hmm. And then they need to be allowed, which I've heard a lot here, to make choices that are best for them. And we got to quit pretending like we know the only choices. And by we, I mean the system, the healthcare system. So I'm going to say that at the end of this, because Pete typed in, maybe we could, my take home for healthcare is start to start to build systems upstream to better help people get to the right place sooner with the with without with acknowledging the 900 pound gorilla in the room that once they get in the system history and research says that this is not the best place for them so i'll end with that yeah i, I really you know in the power of the Pete's and the virginias and right who aren't tied to the system and they've created things that are very successful so i'm like we look at them like oh that's so cool all right send all your patients to me pete you know send all your people to me pete and i'm like no we should be sending all our people it should be going the other way right and i love what you're sharing these days pete the self-care stuff and i love the questions you're asking out there i believe that is a huge part of the solution now i'm not saying everybody with pain has to become you know these big advocates but if we got people like pete we got people like Virginia out there and everybody else on here, Keith, sorry, everybody else. I think maybe Dave and I are the only ones that, you know, I, I don't, I'm not a pain patient, so I don't speak from that side. But, you know, if, if, if we help get pizza, I, I would think, Pete, I retweet more of your stuff than anybody else I would like to believe because I see the power in this. I believe, sorry, I believe in the power of this. So, yeah, I I, I, th I think this is really cool. See, this is why I want to come on here, by the way, right? Th this is the stuff I wanted to hear. And who would have thought I'd leave her going, yeah, it really is the people that are going to make the change, not the providers, right? That was all. Power to the people, Jerry. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know me. Yeah. Yeah. You know me. I'll turn that up loud. <laughs> there you go, so, man. There you go, man. Jerry, I think that's, I think that's about awesome. us. Without us thing, isn't it? It's, it's nothing about people living with pain without including people with pain. Um, that's my message. Simple enough, yeah. You know, and, and that's an old message. So with meaningful music movement, not music, meaningful movement for me, I would say, let's look at everything that you do in a day as an opportunity to feel what your body can do. And that can be as little as, I'll be getting up from here, um, putting some music on and doing a three minute dance to boogie to some music. That'll be for me. And then I'm going out gardening. And that's where we start. It's not where we stop, it's where we start. And then we can start to build on that. Um, gain confidence, yeah. I think uh, like you said, Pete, it's an opportunity here to get a sort of a takeaway uh, message from everybody. So, I mean, Jerry started us off with his uh, his comments and, and Bronnie there. So why don't we sort of quickly through the move through the rest of the group here and then we can, I think we'll be wrapping it up. So um, again, I'm gonna follow my screen. So next up, Virginia. Mm. Oh, great. Um, I'm gonna do two get, um, takeaways and I'm gonna build on what Jerry said. Uh, one is, uh, see the value in what Pete and I do. And what I do is an extension of Pete does is the self-management, the peer supports the self-management. We, we um, preach the pain toolkit. So, you know, see the importance and the value of it and the importance of supporting these things uh, as for healthcare providers and the, uh, for people living with pain, whatever you're going to do, enjoy it. And it's okay if what you did yesterday, you can't do today and you have to go back a minute. It's okay if you can only walk to the end of the driveway. It's okay if you can only do it if you have someone with you and you need that support. That's okay because it could be someone that you call when you're going for your walk or something you walk mm -hmm. with. So kindness, self-kindness. Beautiful. Amy. Uh, so many, so many good things said today. I, I think what I'm walking away with is... Um, that continued thought of 
pairing with our healthcare providers like David and understanding that they're as trapped as we are sometimes, well, mm -hmm. really all the time, yeah. and that there is compassion that needs to be had when appointments don't go the way that we think that they should. Mm -hmm. um, and to, so I know that that's not about movement, but just it's easy to get mad at providers and not understand the system. And so I think when we're talking about educating those with chronic illness, chronic pain, education about the system and its limitations is also part of that because it, it, it's another thing that helps kick you out of the system in, in the long run. And uh, when I think about movement, I, I just think that it has reinforced, this conversation has reinforced yet again, the importance of it's what's important to the human in front of you. It's not about what I think they need to do. It's about what they want and need to be able to live a life that is meaningful to them. Yeah. Not me, because I don't really matter. I'm just there as a conduit with information to help you get there. Mm. Well said, <laughs> David. You know, I, I think I, I've said it and everyone else has said it, um, you know, we're all of the same mindset here, right? I think we all have similar beliefs and, and values when it comes to caring for patients with, with chronic pain. Um, you know, I, what Amy just said, you know, I, I really do believe, like I really go into the clinic every day, um, you know, with that, uh, uh, mindset um, and, and culture of you know what it's not what's it's not about me right and so many and, and Jerry you talked about egos right like man are there some egos and it, it, it's not about me and when I say me I mean us right like it, we really you know if there's students listening to this or other providers who may be nervous about chronic pain care you know it's not about you it's about the patient right and small wins, while they may seem small to, to us, they could be massive to the patient, right? Uh, it's not about the prescription pad. It's not about the needle. Uh, it's about improving someone's quality of life mentally, physically, socially. Uh, and however we can achieve that, um, you know, th that's what I believe in. Uh, how to fix the system, I don't know. I I'd love to hear more of what Jerry has to say. I'm really digging his vibe um, <laughs> and, 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 you know, accessing people like Virginia, you know, I've often thought about, you know, cause we're in Canada, the people in pain network and thinking, you know, mm. you don't need me. You need peer support. You need people like Virginia and her group. Mm. And, uh, you know, we haven't touched on, we touched a bit on remuneration and models to provide care, but you know, when, when I'm dealing with third-party providers, insurance companies, workers compensation boards, man, are they focused on, what did the doctor say? What did the surgeon say? What are they going to cut open? Yeah. What are they going to fix? Yeah. Yeah. And this patient doesn't need that. This patient mm -hmm. needs support. They need all the other things we talked about tonight. And then lo and behold, this poor patient is cut off. They lose their benefits. Mm -hmm. I really want to see more education and more system change in that regard, because as a provider, it is so defeating to mm -hmm. see my patients go up against all that. And I'm just one person, I can't fix it. We really got to get into, you know, the medical associations, the professional organizations, the advocacy groups. We really got to hit this stuff home. Um, anyway, that's my take home. It was a pleasure to speak to all you guys tonight. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's an honor to be around like-minded people. That was wonderful, David. Well, Pete, what do you think, my friend? Oh, well, <laughs> this, this is... Uh... <laughs> I'm sitting here just thinking, can we do another hour and a half? Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, it's, uh, I've, I've got to be honest with you guys, some, I'll get down sometimes because I feel feel like sometimes I'm uh, head banging, you know, and so when I when I do stuff like this with you guys, it's uh, it does put a lot of wind back in the sails, really, you know, and uh, because uh, this, with every, you know, listen. I, I listen. Well, I watch and read things that going on, on social media with people, and it's they, they, especially with healthcare professionals. It they sound like patients. <laughs> they're, um, they're 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 as stuck as we are. 
And just what I put up there, I think, you know, do we need to, what, what's the, I don't know what, what's, what's the fix, you know? How do we, how do we, how do we get around this massive boulder called a medical model? How do we get around that? Uh, we can't, I think, um, some, how can we get around it? I don't think we can drive through it or get, get out of the way, but I think we just, it's a, it's an initiative, I think, that we've got, we need to put together. And, there, and it's not, it's not, not, it is, it is possible because we have, there are people like us tonight uh, or today, wherever you are in the world, um, who, who have got that, those skills and knowledge like, you know, uh, I've, I'm, I'm actually working on it already a little bit, you know, about, um, from an educational point of view, like, you know, but I, I I've got, I, I'll tell you a bit more about that another time. But uh, funny enough, you said about ego and stuff like that. And I always remember I went to a meeting once years ago. And I'm, so it's a bloody bunch around here. <laughs> mosquitoes and whatnot for some reason. Um, there's a, there was a sign above the door. It says, leave your ego here and pick it up on the way out. And I try to do that each day, really, like, you know, and I don't, I know people would say about the toolkit and stuff like that. The talk it ain't me it's you you know it's everybody's you know it's not my um i put yeah i put it together but to me it, i didn't put it together for pete it's for everyone anybody because i don't want people to go through the crap i went through uh and I, and I, and that's and that's, that's what it's about really like you know but it's you know my constant daily battle is really is to get you know go try and find the doors that not up then always open for me but there perhaps they're a job you know the opportunities where i can you know get in there and stuff like that and i don't know about you virginia but the biggest struggle i have in, in the moment is uh is uh not money for me but money to keep the thing going like you know where it's always been a constant struggle in it virginia trying to keep these things running uh because they, they don't they like and then i have to run it like like jerry you know that's why i like jerry's stuff because he's yeah sure it's a, it's a resource but it's i have to run the toolkit like a business like you know and um and uh, but and like any business it has expenses so I, I i don't get funded by anyone or the paint toolkit doesn't get funded so i to rely on doing workshops and um uh, sales from the digital books and whatnot to keep things running so i think we need somewhere along the line and when I don't know. Perhaps we need to have uh, another one of these, or I don't know, uh, but to, or another one where we're just chatting about how do we move things forward? Because we've got to do something, you know, and that something is us. Uh, and I always remember laying in bed one night thinking, saying to myself, "Why don't they get it? Why don't they get it?" And then I realised it's the it, it. They don't. It's the it. How can I? What, what can I do to change the word for it to do, you know? And it's about move, how do we how do we move it, move something on, put some juice in. We need some juice to go in the vehicle because we're going to take this journey on uh, developing some stuff like that. Yeah. No, we can't, you know, we're, we're, we're just a few of, of many. So, um, but I, 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 you know, just to sort of wrap things up, I think it's been one hell of a meeting, mate. And, and, uh, I don't know if I'm speaking out of line here, but I, I, if you you guys want to come back, Jerry and Dave, you know you you know you'd be most welcome, right? You know, be part. I think you're part of our family, really now. And Toby will be back hopefully next time around. So if you want to come back, let us know, and you know, send out the invites, you know. But anyway, um, right, Pete. I think uh, it's like I said, it's refreshing and it's it's lovely to speak to everybody and get the perspectives and. Uh, yeah, I'd be back in a heartbeat. Yeah, so okay. would I. And and I would love, um, Pete, to your point, you know, so we raise all this, we say what's wrong today, and and I think you're alluding to this, you know, so we come back and let, let, let's talk what we feel are solutions, legit mm -hmm. solutions that can, and maybe that's the challenge to anybody who watches this, anybody who listens, yeah. think about you know, and what, what I try to do, and this is what I do with, with the work I'm doing with the clinics is, this is the other thing, right? 
in, in the traditional model. We get someone in and we talk so broad and so big, the person can't see the next step, mm -hmm. right? And so I've really tried to get everybody to slow down and talk about, present a little bit of the future, but say in order to hit that future, right? We need to take this next step. So I would love to get back in here and, and talk possible yeah. next steps, right? With the bigger vision in mind. But what do we do? We talk about the vision, we go away and we get lost. And I think just going back to what's the next step is I think there's value in, um, and I think you've been trying to do this, Pete, and I'd say it'd be beneficial for Virginia too, is, you know, we, by the way, we, the establishment, the system should be looking for opportunities for you all to show up places to share and talk and get, mm. are you ready? Paid for it, <laughs> right? Yeah, right. So that, that's something I would love to explore. So because, right, I'm the one who said it the loudest. I think Virginia and Pete, what you guys are doing is a huge chunk of success here uh, for people. So how do we help to amplify your voices and yeah. the work you're doing, not yep. through people, right? Like, like I said, right, this, oh, I'll put you on the schedule for four weeks out. Oh, I know you have to take an hour drive here. I know it's an hour drive home. You can wait four weeks. To, to drive here for an hour, to hear we can't help you and drive back home and have no fucking solutions. Can I curse here? I hope. Um, because we do it every day to people, right? And right. So, so rather than talking about that, let's talk about how people can access you and how you guys can help other people understand the value of the, I'm going to call it peer group. So I'm happy to come maybe back. That, that maybe that might be a dedicated one. I'd like. I still want to try and keep it on, on if we can at the uh, these conversations around self management because the, uh, but perhaps we can have like a dedicated one where we can come up with not ideas. It's but it's uh, what's the next steps like sort of thing. You know, new I call it new beginnings. You know, well, I don't know. I, I think good. that's a great term. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've got some actions that we are doing in New Zealand and Australia that, you know, with peer leaders and, and co-producing. Mm. And it would be lovely to share some of that and, and whatever else is happening where people, peers and people who live with pain are integrated. It'd be lovely to have a session just on that, just to show how valued people with living with pain are in some places and how much we can contribute well i'll, I'll tell you what so that should that do you want i mean it's i listen it's your gig you know it's all our gig would what would you like to put the third conversation to be about that next you know, step. Uh, you know, yeah I, yeah next step. i think that's and a good steps idea. that are happening yeah. and yeah. and yeah yeah i, I think yeah. people need to hear that i think yeah. they to to follow your your vision pete you want to keep it self-management. I think that is because I, I want to see more people okay. find you guys. Right. Listen, I'll, go, I'll go over that. I'll take it. Right. And I, I think it, I think it feeds the vision of right. Helping yeah. people to understand, like Bronnie said, what are they currently doing? Right. Mm -hmm. well, so what, what are we going to call it? Yeah. What's it going to be? What's going to, what are we going to call it? We'll come up with something snappy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah come, we'll start coming up with something yes. snappy now. <laughs> 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 It's time for me to drink. I, I have yeah. to get a drink first. Yeah. It's six thirty here. I like to yeah. say I'm behind on my drinking right now. <laughs> He's here. I'm still at work. Yeah, You know, we're all in different places with different policies and different, you know, rules surrounding us, right? But I, you know, I like the hive mind here, and I and really I like Jerry's chutzpah. I love it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, but in order to raise awareness for, you know, Virginia's group uh, in Canada and Pete's, you know, project in the UK, you know, like Virginia is familiar with the Atlantic Mentorship Network, which, you know, um, I'm a part of in, in our group informs, you know, policy making on chronic pain care uh, in, in the primary care sphere, you know, so, you know, when we talk to government, uh, you know, medical schools, universities, who may fund the larger project, but then, you know, bring projects like Pete and Virginia's into that under that umbrella, right? Mm -hmm. And say, okay, well, you know, here, we have a solution, right? We have a package. And inside that package, we've got the people mm -hmm. in pain network, 
we've got a pain self-management group with Pete over there in, in England, right? You know, and we get funding for our individual groups in our jurisdictions, but within those groups, we have resource X, Y, and Z that falls into yeah. this management piece, right? And that's how we can raise awareness and that's how we can get the money to, to mm -hmm. spend on raising awareness and delivering these initiatives. That's just my first, you know, initial thought, right? Because we don't need to reinvent what are already existing awesome tools. You know, yeah. there's this desire to brand it something, but actually embedding what exists mm -hmm. into what we do. Yeah, and using what we've already got. Context. Yeah, use what's there yeah. and leverage from that. These things are tried and tested. You know, they work. So use them. We've already tried and tested. See, that's, there you go, solutions, right? But talking about the solutions with the people who are doing things, tried and tested right and not reinventing the wheel right of going oh i have this big vision i'm gonna do it you know and then not taking the input it's kind of yeah. was the theme of all day right not taking the input from the people yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. right well i'm gonna would... call it a day there and then if you can uh, stay online because so we need to sort out a date for the next one all right and i would yep. like to just say before we we wrap up for our viewing audience um i deeply appreciate all of you uh money you know i love you dearly. virginia amy uh same as well david just first met you but thank you so much for coming and sharing your experiences on the front lines in the clinic up to your elbows in this shit and dealing with it in the most effective way that you can and jerry brother man i you were just a force to be reckoned with man i just love what you do and your energy just permeates through this little box called uh, Zoom. So um, I love the conversations on, on meaningful movement. Um, I, it's so important. And uh, being one who, David, when you talked about the barriers, I was the guy, you know, 30 years ago was, I can't do any of that because I'm going to, it's it's wrong and I can't do it. Um, so I love where these conversations go, Pete, like you'd said before, you know, these spin off in all these other directions. And our next direction we're going to talk about is how we're going to take these great ideas and actually implement them to mean something. So it's, this is just beautiful. So thank you for joining us. Well, thanks everyone. Thank you. If you. you're uh, wherever you're watching this in the world, uh, be cool and groovy, look after one another, be kind to one another, take care. We'll see you again soon. Ciao.